you've ever said this, that, well, I just couldn't resist it. I couldn't resist it. I just gave in. I couldn't resist going to the freezer and pulling out that chocolate ice cream because the craving was so strong that I could not resist it. Now, I paid for it later, but I couldn't resist it in the moment. There are some people that today that are very spiritual. They're so spiritual that they say, Now, Lord, if you, uh, if it's your will for me to go to Dunkin' Donuts and to get that, that, that donut, <laughs> then let there be a parking spot right in front of the door. Tell me nobody's done that. Oh, sure, we've all thought that at some point in time. And so you're like, you, you drive up and there's no parking spot. You're like, well, and you start circling the building eight times until that spot opens up. <laughs> Anybody can relate with me today? It's just a miracle. You just couldn't, couldn't resist it. So I want to talk to you today that these are, these are really moments in our life that uh, we can deal with areas of weakness in, within all of us that sometimes it is. It's hard. It's hard, it's hard to resist. Um, you know, it's, it's easy you know, to sometimes get caught up into buying it, clicking on it, eating it, drinking it, smoking it, saying it, betting on it. Or even telling someone else about it. These are all temptations that I'm going to be dealing with this morning that, that are, are, are things that we all, we all do. Matter of fact, we can get to a point that we just, I just have to. I, I have to have this. And how many of you know today and have ever had buyer's remorse? You bought something. And then you're like, what in the world uh, did I do? I, 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 you know, I, I went on a shopping spree on Amazon on Saturday and Monday. I'm at UPS returning it all. <laughs> you know, we, we, we can deal with this, and yet we can feel very vulnerable to temptation. But I want you to know today that you and I are not alone. And that I want you to know today that there is good news and there is a way out of our temptation. Are you thankful for that? Yeah. Amen. Before we go in the Word of God, Father, we love you today. And we're thankful today for the Word of God that we're going to, to, to hear. And it is my prayer today that this Word, as it goes forth unto our hearing, Lord, I pray that let it sink into our hearts, into our lives, and that it will help us to become stronger in every area of our life. And for that, we'll be sure to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 4, and begin reading in verse number one, the Bible says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus looked at him and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command the angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so you will not, so you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, that you shall not put the Lord your God to test. And again, the devil took him into a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, 
You shall not wor- you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. And that is my scripture text today, uh, the foundation that I want to to talk to us about. Isn't it amazing today that the enemy uh, tried to tried to uh, tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness in a low point. And a point that physically he had been fasting without food for for over 40 days and 40 nights. Isn't it amazing today that that Jesus himself went back and referred to the word of God every time to be able to fight the enemy. Let me just kind of cut to the chase today and tell you that the greatest weapon that you and I will ever have is... And conquering and fighting the enemy is the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It is the Word today that needs to be hidden down deep in your heart and in your life. It is the Word of God today that is the only thing that you can fight in the day and age that we live in. We are living and fighting in a spiritual warfare. Amen. And your word of God today is what helps us to navigate through this life, but also helps us to be able to resist the very temptations of of this world. Amen. The Bible lets us know in 1 John chapter 2 and uh, verse uh, 15, Do not love the world nor the things of the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, here it is, there are three categories, and that it is this. It is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is of the world. The three things that the enemy will always use to tempt us are those three things. It is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life. Of life, it was the very three things that he used to tempt Jesus. Those very three areas. In my my study and diving into commentaries, even on this, it was brought out that some people think that worldliness has to do with external behavior. Worldliness has to do with with how some ex, someone externally looks, but yet with with that, people will associate. With the places that we go, the activities that we enjoy, and we can say that that well, that is a worldly environment. But I want you to know today that worldliness affects more of the internally than it ever will do the externally. As a matter of fact, I can look apart, dress apart, and not even go to all the worldly places, and yet internally I am more worldly than all those other things. Because there's something that happens with inside of the heart that it, it affects us. And it is characterized by these, these three attitudes. It is simply that, that we, we c- can crave and, uh, and, and, uh, or deal with the physical pleasure. Uh, we, can, we can deal with the craving for everything that we see. We can deal with, with the, the, the pride uh, with inside of us. And these are all things today that nobody else can see. But are things that you and I, I, I deal with. It is that craving for physical pleasure. Being preoccupied with, uh, with the gratifying of the physical desires. It is craving for everything that we see. The, the accumulations of things. The, the bowing down to the God of materialism. And then also the pride in our very own achievement and possessions. Uh, that And we can become so obsessed with our status of importance. These are the, the very temptations and the very things that, that all of us today can deal with. And so we can kind of uh, lay aside some of the things that we can talk about world uh, events and say all of us today can deal with that inside uh, of us. And yet today I want you to know that, that God has made a way of escape for all of us to be able to resist that very own 
temptation. So what is temptation? What is temptation? Tim Charlie said that temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. Temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. Meaning that when I am I'm hurting uh, internally, I, I, I'm hurting that, that I, it'd be easy to turn to something else to, to wash away that hurt. And some of you today that were before Christ, can you, can you let your mind go back? You were, there was a hurting, there was a pain, and so you turned to alcohol, you turned to, to pills, you, you turned to something to be able to, to dull the pain that was in your life. And the same thing that happens in church. People who are saved, they, there's a lot of people that turn to, to, to other things and, and to pills or whatever it may be to be able to dull whatever pain, maybe emotionally or mentally, or whatever it may be, they, they're dulling the pain that is in their life. Sometimes people, they, they, they're so low and, and uh, they, they begin to binge on certain things that they enjoy seeing. And they, they get caught up in it. And sometimes people are just, they're just low. They're just so low. Life's hard. They, they, maybe a low self-esteem. And so they get caught up. And they, they justify themselves by gossiping. They're low. They don't feel well about themselves. And to make themselves feel better about themselves, they, they justify by gossiping or becoming critical. And it, what it does in the moment of them being low is they're not really realizing how low that they are, but instead that, that it makes them feel better. Did you see what so-and-so did? Did you hear this? And so they, they began to gossip. They began to criticize. I, I don't know why he's doing that. That was, a, that was a stupid mistake. Did you see? Did you, did you hear what so-and-so did? And so it, all of a sudden when they do that, what are they doing? They're trying to make themselves feel better simply by making others look bad. And so anything that you're tempted... When you are tempted, you, you do things and, and temptation will promise a satisfaction. But it is at the cost of your obedience to God. Temptation is anything that promises satisfaction in the moment at the cost of your obedience to God. So there are, they say that there are, there are processes to this temptation. There's a process to it. And that is the first part is that there it always begins with a thought. Temptation always starts with a thought. And then from the thought builds this imagination. And from the imagination goes into justification. And out of justification comes choice. So let's look at this. The process of temptation is, is that it begins with a thought. I'm depressed. And so I thought. I thought that by me going on my phone, sitting on the couch because I'm depressed, that I can start scrolling at new outfits and I can go to untuck it or I can go to whatever it may be, express or anything else. And some of you are there and some of you are like, I don't do that. Whatever it may be. You, some of you have some old catalogs still from back in the day that they no longer make any longer. Anybody remember those big old J.C. Penney catalogs and the Sears catalogs? Yeah, and you would go flipping through until you found what you wanted, and then you earmarked it, and then you just had to go find it in the store. So we deal with the press and say, so "Man, I, I don't feel well about myself," and so maybe a newer outfit will make me feel better about myself. It is a thought. And then all of a sudden it moves to imagination. You begin to think. You begin to say, man, if I had this, I would look so good in it. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you go on and you start going on, you know, Instagram. And you start looking at pictures. 
You're like, wow, look at that. I like this and I like that. And then you move to the point of justification. I work hard. I've worked hard. I think I deserve this. Matter of fact, if I can just find it on sale, then I know it's the will of God for me to buy it. Everybody's laughing, but you all, it must be the truth today. And then, then it goes to the point of choice. You search until you find that sale. And when you can't find the sale, you go to retail me not. And you're like, I will find me a promo code somewhere because I have to have it because I need to feel better about myself. And oh, by the way, since I'm there, they just so happen to have that with that that beautiful outfit that you're looking at, here are the matching shoes that you can have, and oh, you need some accessories, you need a new watch to go with that. All these things simply to make you feel better. And how many of you today can testify that you've bought that and you feel good for the moment, but it doesn't last? You give in to the temptation. I mean, it's like somebody, somebody that you know, they, they all of a sudden, they get a, a new car. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh my word, I see that new car everywhere I go. And then the temptation is, well, let me go see. Oh my word, interest rates are out of this world. Let me see about leasing this thing. How can I, how can I make this work? And if I can just get to the dealer, and if they can just get that price down into my, oh, it will be the will of God if they can get it to $499.98 to fit within my budget, then it must be the will of God. And you get there, and they somehow do it, but then you weren't paying attention how that that salesperson was able to stretch you out to the next 30 years to buy that car. But it was the will of God, and it makes you feel good in the moment. The problem is we need to go back to why we are dealing with temptation and understand that there is a process of temptation. And that is, it starts with a thought, then you begin to imagine it, then you justify it, and then it becomes the choice. And so, we all deal with that. You know, the thought, I'm bored. One of the worst things to do if you're bored is to start scrolling on the gram. Because you see other people's life. And you see other people's vacation. And you see how so-and-so, I mean, they're out, they're out in Branson, Missouri. And they, they're up in... in, in uh, golfing in you know and in, in 50 degree weather while it's like 130 here in Florida. <laughs> All of a sudden, the thought, and then it goes into the imagination, and then justification, and then a choice. So everything starts with a thought. It starts with a thought. There are three truths about temptation, and this is what I want to help us with today. The first truth about temptation is simply this, is that it is not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 that this high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all the same testings as we do, yet he did not sin. I want you to know today that Jesus Christ understands our weakness and he was tempted like you and I are but he did not sin. He understands every temptation. Everything that we've gone through yet without, without sin. So becoming a Christian doesn't mean that we won't be tempted. Sadly, and more likely, when we start serving God and we turn our attention towards God, that we deal more with temptation now than we ever did before. A lot of that is because now you are alert to it. Now you, you see it. You see, the devil, he, he, he's not threatened when you're doing his will. And when you're going along with him, he, you're no threat. You, it doesn't bother him one bit. You're going to the same place as he is. But when you're going to a better place than where he's going, he's going to bring out every temptation that he can 
to try to stop you, to try to detour you. But I want you to know today, it's okay if you're dealing with temptation. And temptation today is not a sin to be dealing with it. But today we can be more than conquerors through it. And so I want you to know, we can't blame God today when we're tempted. I mean, people, they'll use that a lot. Well, God tempted me. God, does, God will never tempt you. God will test you, but He will never tempt you. God will bring uh, testings in your life to simply to make you stronger, to build you up, to build up the, that, that spiritual strength within you. And most of us today, when we can go back and we think about our, our early uh, walk with God, and some of the temptations that we went through then versus what we go through now, you and I can say it was through those temptations and through those, those, those testings in my early walk with God that's helped me to conquer and to be who I am today. Amen. And so God, He may test you, but He will never, ever tempt, tempt you. James chapter 1, verse 13. And remember that when you were being tempted... Do not say that God is tempting me. God never tempts anyone. But temptations come from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And so remember this today. The temptation that you're facing is not from God, is from the, from the devil. Temptations come from our own desires. I am thankful today that there, there's a day coming when I get a new body. Yes, a new body. And that new body is not going to have temptation. It's not. It's not going to have it. And so we are tempted from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. And these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to, de to, to death. And so God, He tests you and His testings are there to help promote you, to elevate you, to propel you forward. But the devil always tempts you to fail you and to pull you or to push you back. God is always drawing you and, and pleading for you and drawing you closer to him. The, uh, the, the enemy is always trying to tempt you, to fail you, and to simply to pull you back. So point number one is that sin itself, it's not a sin to be tempted. Point number two is this, is that you're most vulnerable to temptation when you're weak. Everybody's got that? You're most vulnerable to temptation when you're weak. The second part of that, and when you think you're strong. Weakness and when you think you're strong is at the moment. Of temptation. Jesus was weak. He was he was hungry. He he was had fasted, and, and he was in a wilderness. He was in a in a dry place, and yet the enemy comes to him in a moment of weakness and says, "If you'll just turn these stones into bread, mm, there's nothing like some hot bread right now." Uh, I could think of some good places that have some good bread right now. Anybody tempted just to grab a glass of water and pop in for some bread and then pop out? <laughs> I'm thinking of red lobster right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, just the bread alone. And then if I want more of the Italian, I'll, uh, I mean, just to go to Carabas and get me some of the, the, you know, the bread with oil. Oh, boy. And so Jesus was in a weak moment, hungry. And the enemy says, can you turn these stones into bread? It's always when we're tired. It's always when we're angry. 
when we're lonely, when we're hurting, that's when it seems like the enemy tries to always sneak in to our lives. Because we're always vulnerable when you're weak. When you're down, you're depressed, you're sad, you're lonely. The enemy will always come into your life and when you are uh, weak because it's when you are vulnerable. But he also comes in when you're strong. And so someone today may say, well, yeah, you know what, my husband, my spouse needs to hear that, this kind of message. You know, well, well oh boy, you know, they're dealing with some things. They need to hear it. Can I tell you today whether they need to hear it? You probably need to hear it because you think you're too strong. The Bible says it like this. So if you think you are, are standing firm, standing strong, be careful not to fail. Be careful that you don't fall. The time that you think that you're strong, be careful. You know, it's amazing that those who are vulnerable and weak and fall, maybe they've fallen into sin. The other, uh, that's one spectrum. Then you've got somebody over here that says, well, by golly, if they would not have put themselves in that, you know, I would have never done that. Be careful. Right. Because if you think that you're strong, uh -huh. you are at the moment of being tempted right. and you can fall into temptation. You can still fail. You ever seen somebody riding on the side of the road? To, you know, you're in a traffic jam or something like that, and you saw somebody, they, they get into the shoulder to bypass? Uh huh. Does that irritate anybody else? Please don't tell me what you say in your car. Yeah, it's easy to criticize them for that. But then what is the difference the other day? I was trying to make the light. And the cars are backed up, and so I decided I didn't do it, but I started to go into the, the shoulder. Because I thought I could make the light. How hypocritical are we? To be sitting in traffic and criticizing because somebody comes whizzing by us in the shoulder. But then we're making a left hand turn. And it's okay for us to kind of go up over the concrete curb a little bit. And we're like, eh. Do you get my point today? Be on alert. The Bible says it like this. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The enemy today is at work. The enemy today, he is, he is roaring, he is looking, he is on the prowl, and he is looking for someone to devour. So if you know that the enemy is coming into your life, if you know that there's a weakness or there's a temptation that you're going to have to deal with, I want you to know if you know that he's coming, then you need to shut the door so that he can never enter into that area. You have to shut the door. Temptation often comes through a door that's been deliberately left open. If the door is open, the enemy can come in at any given time. But when the door is shut, and the door is locked. The enemy can't come in that way. I'm not telling you today. I will tell you this. He will always try to find another opening. Sure. Always. And that's why you have to be alert. You have to be one that is, is on alert to understand that the enemy is always going to try to tempt you. How many of you ever binged on M&M's? Mm. Benjamin on M&M's. I mean, before you knew it, the whole bag was gone. Or for me, it, it, it's, it's gummy bears. I like gummy bears. But, you know, at a certain point, the older you get, they don't like you back. All of us today have had that moment where we've binged on something. 
you know, you're not even thinking about it. You're watching something and you just reach over and you're just getting into that bag of M&Ms until you realize, oh snap, somebody else ate them. It wasn't me. <laughs> We've all dealt with that. But can I tell you today, there's not one time I have ever binged on M&Ms that they weren't nearby. If it's not there, then I cannot do it. And so here's the next point. One of the best ways to resist temptation is to eliminate it. Eliminate it. Eliminate it. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 14 and 15. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of the evildoer. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go your own way. The only way to resist temptation is to eliminate it. Stay away from it. Oh, but, you know, it's not that big of a deal. It was just one drink. I mean, you know, it was, it's not really that big of a deal. Yeah, going to the gym, but I'm seeing... Wow, did you see that girl? If I'm dealing with that type of a temptation, then maybe I shouldn't be going to the gym. Maybe I should close that door and find another way to work out. Maybe if I'm doing nothing more than on the gram and I'm comparing myself all the time, maybe it's time that I delete Instagram, the gram, or the Facebook, whatever it may be. Delete it because I am dealing with that temptation of comparing myself. What if somebody today is dealing with, you know, looking at the opposite and they're contemplating an, a, an affair? The best way to, to resist that part is to get away from it. Maybe transfer to another location or another job or even quit because your family and your life is much more important than a one-time deal. And so it is today that the best way that you and I could ever resist temptation is to close the door and it is simply to eliminate it, eliminate it. And so it's not a sin to be tempted. I'm most vulnerable when I'm weak and when I think that I'm strong. But I want you to know this. God will always make a way out. Yes. Always. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. And God is faithful. Anybody thankful for a faithful God today? God is faithful. And He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will pro always provide a way out so that you can endure. He makes a way of escape. Whether or not you go that way or not, that's between you and God. But God will always make a way of escape. Why? Because I serve today and you serve a faithful God. Amen. You thankful for that today? Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? He will always make a way out. How will He? He, is in, he has given me the Word of God. He will always show me a way out, a way of escape out of every situation that I am dealing with. Can I tell you today in closing that when Jesus was tempted, Jesus used the Word of God on the enemy. Jesus used the Word of God. When the devil said, turn these stones and the bread, Jesus said that people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. When the enemy came in to tempt him and said, throw yourself down from this mountain, Jesus quoted and said, do not put the Lord your God to test. And when the enemy came in and said, why don't you just bow yourself down to me? I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. Jesus quoted the word, the word of God and said, get away from me, Satan, for it is written to worship the Lord your God and to serve him only. I'm here today to tell you your greatest weapon in this life is the word of God. Yeah. It's the word of God. 
And our world today is trying to push that word away. What is it? That is the very spirit of the Antichrist. Pushing it away. Be on alert. Because the devil is attacking. The enemy will always try to attack. He will promise these satisfactions. But it will be at the cost of your obedience to God. Your obedience to God. Isn't it amazing that when we deal with temptation and afterwards we have to do, deal with sorrow. After temptation, we deal with sorrow. The Bible tells us that there are two types of sorrow. That is, number one, is that there is worldly sorrow, and then there is godly sorrow. We're always going to deal with sorrow, but it will either be worldly sorrow or godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is this, that you become very defensive because you got caught. Become very argumentative. You're hesitant to admit your guilt. You're, you're sorry that you got caught. You make excuses. You try to minimize the pain. That is worldly sorrow. But godly sorrow is a deep and sincere brokenness over what you've done. It is that genuine humility and grief that you are you're hurt because you hurt God. Two different types of aspects. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. For this kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and in the result in results in salvation. There's no regret for this kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. So it is today my choice that for me to repent, that I want the godly sorrow in my life and not the worldly. I don't want to sit here and try to justify by what I did, but understand today I may have hurt I may have hurt God, and I never want to hurt Him. Yeah. I close with this. The fact that the Spirit had led the Son of Man into the wilderness to be tempted creates this interesting contrast in the event in Scripture. The Bible lets us know that Adam, the first man, was in a lush and fruitful garden when he was tempted. And yet Adam failed in a fruitful and a lush place. Begin to think about that. Isn't it amazing? Always when we're going down, we're like, man, if I could just be here, it'd be so much easier. But you, I, want you, I want to compare this today. That Adam had that and he failed. He was tempted and he failed the test. Plunging all of humanity into sin and death. But in contrast, Jesus, the second Adam, was tempted in a dry and barren wilderness. Our paradise was lost. And Jesus passed the test, not once, but all three times. And it is in Him that the Adamic curse is reversed. And now you and I can have eternal life. Both Adams were tempted. One in a lush and a fruitful one and a dry and barren. One and a fruitful failed, but the one and the dry and the barren conquered. For if by the trespasses of one man death reigned through one, one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in, in life? Through the one man, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm thankful today Amen. that the Messiah that I serve, He understands me. He understands you. He understands all the temptations that you and I have gone through. Yet, He's perfect without sin. 
and with his spirit living inside of us, I can't not do it alone and by myself. But with his spirit today yeah. is what helps to enable me to shut the door and to lock it. To say, oh, the enemy, you're not coming in this door any longer. Amen. I hope the word of God today has been a help and a strength uh, to all of us today. Amen. Understanding today that I can shut the door. I can eliminate whatever it is today that is bringing me down. I don't have to live with guilt. I don't have to live with shame. I can understand today that the Spirit of God is living inside of me and it can help me to be strong and to conquer.